Welcome back. Uh, today we're going to cover the remainder of Module 5 in your textbook. This begins on page 5-20 uh, where it reads qualification of procedures and welders. Um, I've got a number of film topics I want you to watch that totals about an hour. What we're going to do is I'm going to talk first of all and give you an overview of what the paperwork is all about. Um, then we're going to watch a film, do some highlighting in our textbook, watch another film, do some more highlighting and so forth until we're done. Um, so essentially, I imagine we want to build a fabrication plant, uh, a chemical plant, a refinery, something like that. How do we get from the point of concept to actually being able to do the work in accordance with the code? All that, co all that welding has to be covered by the welding code and uh, you have to have what is called a qualified welding procedure and then you have to certify your welders. Well, if we start out, uh, how do we qualify a welding procedure? As the engineer, the engineer would have to say, I'm going to take this type of material and I'm going to weld it with this type of welding filler metal and we're going to use this much amperage and this much voltage and we're going to weld it in this direction. Uh, if it's really thick stuff, we're going to preheat it and then when we're done we're going to stress relieve it. All of these things are called essential variables. So the welder, pardon me, the welding engineer has to think about this and bring all those elements together and he does what's called a preliminary PQR. I think I'm spelling that wrong. Uh, another name for it is uh, a test information form. Um, that's called a TIF for short, a TIF. And what we have to do is we do a procedure qualification record. And what this record does is it records all of those essential variables that I was just mentioning. So if I'm the welding engineer and I need to weld some 6 inch schedule 80 pipe and some 2 inch schedule 40 pipe, we're going to do a weldment uh, to, to, re to test whether or not what I have in mind is going to work. So what I'm going to do is on this, on this test information form, this preliminary, th these preliminary instructions that you as the welder is going to are going to follow, I might say, okay, I want you to put the, put the weldment in the 6G position. Okay, that's one essential variable, the position. Then I'm going to say, okay, I want you to weld, weld it from the bottom to the top. That's direction of welding. That's another essential variable. Then I'm going to say, okay, I want you to put the root pass in with gas tungsten arc welding process. That's an essential variable. Then I'm going to say, all right, you're going to fill it and cap it with the shielded metal arc welding process. That's an essential variable. Now I'm going to say, okay, you're going to use 70 amps to put your TIG root pass in. That's an essential variable. And you're going to use 110 amps to put your filler metal and your cap on. That's an essential variable. These are all essential variables that will be recorded on the test information form to give you guidance to make this weldment. Now, as you're actually making the weldment, we have to record what actually happens. So I might say, I want you to weld it with 70 amps but we're going to look at the machine that you're, that you're welding on and I'm going to use my meter to actually record it. So let's say, it, say I said, I told you I want you to do it at 70 amps, but when I check your machine, you're actually running at 74 amps. Okay, I have to record on our test information form exactly how many amps you were using. If I said you need to use 110 amps and we check it and I find that it's really actually going at 117 amps, then that information I have to record. So a procedure qualification record 
records the actual variables that were used in the welding of this test specimen. Then when we're all done, we go to the code book, and the code book will tell us how, how we are to inspect this thing. It's got to pass visual inspection, of course. We have to look at it, make sure there's no undercut or too much metal on the inside of the root, and all of this stuff. But it's also going to tell us that we have to take some specimens that we, we're going to destroy in testing. We're going to take a, a tinsel specimen from here and a tinsel specimen from here, and we'll probably take a couple of face specimens and a couple of root, root specimens, and we're going to cut them out of this thing, and then we're going to subject them to destructive testing. So if it meets all of the mechanical requirements of the code, and, and essentially what we're doing is testing whether or not our welding procedure is going to join these two pieces of metal together and still maintain its, its uh, mechanical properties. If it does that, then we have a qualified welding procedure. And all of this information is recorded on that uh, procedure qualification record. So now we take our procedure qualification record, and from that, we're going to write a document called a welding procedure specification. Now you remember from our previous discussion, uh, a specification is something that uh, will give us the variables and the, re the criteria that have to be followed in the fabrication or manufacture of something. And what this is, these are the instructions based on our PQR that we have come up with that will go out into the fabrication shop or out to the work site that all the welders out there will have to follow whenever they make welds. So welding procedure specification now, it differs from a procedure qualification record in that this one has some ranges. If, if um, you took 74 amps to weld your gas tungsten arc process, as the welding engineer I might say, okay, that's, let's establish a range, uh, range of from 60 to 90 amps for the gas tungsten arc welding process. So I have given my welders this range of amperages that they have to stay in while they're following this procedure. So it gives them some leeway. It's instructions to the, to the welders. The same with our, with our shielded metal arc. If it took 110 amps and, and I actually recorded 117, I might sit there and go, okay, let's give them a range of 100 to, oh, 135 amps. And so I'm giving my welders some leeway. These, these are called our, our parameters. As long as we stay in these parameters, the mechanical properties should stay the same. But if you get outside of these parameters that we've established in our welding procedure, then you have to write a new procedure. So you cannot go beyond what's been written here, what's been written in the welding procedure specification. Another example might be the root opening. Say when we, that doesn't work here, let's try another one. Say, uh, say when we draw the joint up, we drew the joint up like this, and we said that this root opening on the actual test that the guy took to qualify it, the root opening was, say, 1 16th of an inch. Well, that's another variable that we can add a range to because certain circumstances may, re may require that that be a little bit tighter or a little bit more wide. So we would say, okay, 1 16th of an inch plus or minus a 32nd of an inch. So we've given you some man maneuvering room in there on that particular variable. So again, that is what this welding procedure specification is all about. It establishes the ranges on the variables, the things that change from weld to weld, that the welder is allowed in whenever they're, they're, they're manufacturing these weldments. And again, and this is very important, if the welder does something that is outside of what's allowed, then either the weld has to be shit canned or, that's a, that's a non-technical term by the way, or you have to write a new welding procedure using those new parameters. Okay, so now we've got our PQR, 
That is our procedure qualification record. Um, and we have established our welding procedure specification. What's the next step? Because we still need qualified welders. Okay? So this, this brings us to our third and final document. And that is called a welder performance qualification record. Welder performance qualification record, WPQR. And what this is, it's a document that says that I watched a welder make a weld in accordance with the welding procedure that we've established and it was visually acceptable and then we did mechanical tests on it. We took a couple of face bins and we took a couple of root bins and they were acceptable in accordance with code. Therefore, the welder met everything that was required so he, has, he is now a qualified welder. He's a qualified welder. And how do we prove that? We prove that by writing him certification papers. Okay? So we have a qualified welder with certification papers. When we speak of a welder as being certified, that means that there is documentation supporting the, that, the fact that that person passed a qualification test. Okay? So those, those are the three types. Of, of qualifications uh, of paperwork that we need to do. And you need to remember them, a PQR, a WPS, and a WPQR. Procedure qualification record, welding procedure specification, and welder performance qualification record. Okay, welcome back. Uh, you should have watched uh, topic number one and filled out that questionnaire to the best of your ability. In our next uh, uh, review, We'll go ahead and go over the answers for, for all of those and see how well you did. Um, I want you to go on to page 520 now, and I want to read from your textbook. And uh, reading under where it says qualification of procedures and welders, it says part of every major welding project, whether completed in the shop or field, is the qualification of welding procedures and welders or welding operators. It is one of the most important preliminary steps in the fabrication process. Uh, too often projects are begun without the benefit of proven welding procedures and personnel. This can result in excessive reject rates in production due to some unsuspected deficiency in the technique, materials, or skill of the operator. So I want you to take a note of what it says right here. Responsibility for the qualification of procedures and welders is the fabricator's responsibility. The reason they do that is because they want to have a chain of liability, essentially, um, all the way through the system. So if I, as a certified welding inspector, test a welder for a company, then that company has to have a representative present while I'm testing that welder and they have to have a qualified welding procedure. And then they have to sign off on the paperwork. I sign off on it as having witnessed and administered the test, but the company representative signs off on it uh, as accepting responsibility for his organization. So responsibility is a very important thing. They want to have that traceability. Just as previously we discussed mill test reports, we wanted to be able, be able to have traceability of that back to the manufacturer. Here we want to have traceability uh, to establish the fact that the company uh, has accepted responsibility, they've done everything that the code says they have to do. Then if there's a failure, they're going to find somebody to blame for that failure. They're going to look, they're going to go back over that quality uh, assurance program and see where did the breakdown occur. So always remember that the responsibility for, for qualification is, is on the fabricator. And that uh, is mentioned in the first column on page 520. It's the second to the last paragraph where it reads, most codes place, place the burden of responsibility for qualification on the fabricator or contractor. Therefore, 
Welding qualifications are statements by the company verifying that the welding procedures and personnel have been tested in accordance with the proper codes and specifications and they are found to be acceptable. Okay? That's a bullet. That will be a question on your test. Go over to the next column and highlight the paragraph that reads, the welding inspector may also become involved with these qualifications from a document review standpoint. One of the responsibilities may be to review both welding procedure and welder qualification forms to determine if they are in accordance with the code and job specifications. Experienced welding inspectors realize that numerous problems, uh, problem spots can be detected and corrected prior to welding if this review is done carefully. Further, most codes give the welding inspector the authority to request that welders be requalified in the event that they continue to pr produce substandard work. So, if I go to work for, for a company, they hire me, and um, I'm going to be their guy. I'm going to protect them from an outside contractor that they bring in to do some work for them. They want to make sure that the work that this outside contractor is doing is up to snuff. They want to make sure that the work this outside contractor is doing is in accordance with the code. Well, one of my first responsibilities then would be to take a look at the welding procedures and the welder qualification papers uh, that that company has on all of its personnel. And if, it, if they're not accurate or if they've expired, then I can raise a red flag and say, this isn't going to work, you need to do something different. Uh, and this has happened numerous times in my career. Uh, the most common thing seems to be um, a welder will be hired by a company and he has papers, papers from a different company. Well, under the code, under most codes, whatever company has hired him, they have to give him a test and he has to be qualified under, under their procedures. But they try to get around that by, by letting some person walk in, well, yeah, I qualified for, for Acme x-rays over here doing roofing trusses, you know, so here's my certification from that, and they go, okay, great, that's great, okay, you're hired. So I have to catch that, uh, because the company that, that's doing the work, they may be doing something entirely different, and that qualification, those papers that the guy has from a previous job may not apply. So it's very important that you uh, check those, those qualification papers and make sure that, that they're pertinent, because a lot of times, uh, a guy might be qualified to weld plate, and you're walking around inspecting the job and you catch him welding pipe. That's a violation and you have to shut him down. And also this paragraph is very important in that it says that if in your opinion the welder or craftsperson is turning out substandard work, you have the authority to shut them down and make them take another test and prove it. Uh, and it is a responsibility. Not only do you have the authority, it's a responsibility to the, to the client that you're working for to protect his interests. And so you would have to do that. Now one last thing I want to read is uh, right down here. It starts in about the middle of this paragraph. It says, the specific qualification testing techniques uh, for brazing can be found in ASME section 9, which describes the various steps involved in the qualification of welding procedures and personnel. Since major codes uh, for example, D11, ASME Section 9, API 1104 handles welding procedures slightly differently. Some of these differences will be noted as we go through here. You are urged, however, to always refer to the appropriate code for specific information about this topic. Every one of those codes that, that is mentioned here, uh, ASME D11, AS, uh, pardon me, AWS D11, ASME Section 9, and API 1104 set forth their own standards of workmanship and and the, uh, a quality that, that those craftspeople have to rise to. And depending on the service conditions, they could be a little more lenient or less lenient. Uh, could be a little more restrictive. Um, so always make sure that you're using the appropriate code to judge the, the workmanship quality of your people. Okay, we are still on page 520 in your text. Um, we're gonna read about procedure qualification. Now remember, that's the first step that we have to do. We have to make sure of the compatibility of, uh, of the base material and the filler metal and that we're using the proper technique. So those things are highlighted in that little blue box right there. And it says, in general, the welding procedure qualification is performed to show the compatibility of the base metals, the weld metal, the type of welding process, and the techniques that are going to be employed. Um, if you take a look over here at my slide, this is the same thing that is listed in that blue box. When we do a procedure qualification, a PQR, 
We're checking the compatibility of base metals, filler metals, processes, and welding techniques that are going to be employed. Whoops, I'm sorry about that. I hate when that happens. There we go. So there's three types of procedure qualification, and that should have been mentioned in, your, in the video you just watched. There are pre-qualified welding procedures, and this is specific to AWS D1.1 welding code. There's procedure qualification testing, which is the type that I described at the very beginning of this lecture. And then there are mock-ups, where you could, would actually make a pretend part and see how well the welding can be done on that pretend part. Um, an example of a mock-up would be something like this, where you've got a plate that we, or a pipe weld that we discussed previously, but now you're going to put what, what's called a restriction ring around it. And this ring will come to within anywhere from one half of an inch to two inches away from where you have to weld. But by putting this restriction ring up there in your way, they're, they're simulating a tight a tight corner where you have to get in to make a weld. So this would be an example of a mock-up. On, on the AWS D1.1 pre-qualified procedures, as the name implies, uh, some of these welds have been made 10 million times, just over and over and over and over again, and, and it just saves time and money if you have a pre-qualified procedure for it uh, because it's universal. And uh, what that would be would be something like uh, Let's take a, a single V groove, like so, and we'll put a backing strip on it, and then we'll fill it and cap it with 7018. Well, this is a very common type of weld. It's done all the time. And because it is done all the time, the AWS D1.1 structural welding code uh, allows you to use their pre-qualified welding procedures. And all you have to do is look up, look up all of the essential variables, and this particular one is called uh, BU2A. Uh, the U means unlimited for unlimited thickness. The B means it's a butt joint. And there's a little, little uh, a slang in there uh, that you need, need to be able to look up. And you'll put this uh, on the welder's qualification papers to show that this is what the welder tested to. So this is pre-qualified. Now, one, one point I want to make about pre-qualified procedures, they only allow them in two cases. The first case is the one I've drawn up here, where they have a backing strip on it. And the other one is where they will ask you to back gouge and back weld it. And, and that's it. So it's either with a backing strip or you have to back gouge and back weld. And that's the only way they allow pre-qualified procedures. They won't allow you to do a pre-qualified procedure. There's no such thing to where you have to weld it from one side and get complete penetration and then fill it and cap it. So that type of a weld is not pre-qualified. That has to be qualified by testing. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers requires that all of their procedures be qualified by testing. So that's the three types, mock-ups, pre-qualified, and qualified by testing. OK, let's see. You can read about that on page uh, 521. Just about the entire first column there talks about pre-qualified welding, pardon me, about the three different types of welding procedures. Now, if you look here at this next slide, uh, the pre-qualified procedures are used by AWS D1.1 and D1.5. Well, D1.1 is the structural welding code used in uh, bridge, con uh, pardon me, not bridge, construct, but uh, building construction, and D1.5 is their bridge building code, so they accept those. There's no need for testing, and it saves time and money, so that's why they like to do that. Um, one note, and I want you to remember this and maybe write it down someplace, is that submerged, pardon me, gas metal arc welding, short circuit transfer is not pre-qualified. They never allow short circuit transfer of gas metal arc to be used on a pre-qualified procedure, there's no such thing. And the reason they do that is because of the low amount of heat input uh, into the weldment when you're using short circuit transfer gas metal arc. So 
We have our pre-qualified and then we have procedure qualification testing. It's done by ASME, API, AWS, and most codes and standards. It covers welding and brazing, and it defines the essential variables. And you remember I wrote about those at the very beginning of this lecture, and some of those would be what type of filler metal are you going to use? What kind of amperages, amperage range are you running? What is the direction of welding? Those are all essential variables. And then they re require testing. You have to test them. You have to do soundness tests. And uh, typical types of soundness tests are, are, are root bends, face bends, uh, tensile pulls. This is an example of a reduced section tensile. And we would take and we would pull that thing apart. We, before we pulled it apart, we would measure this area so that we could calculate its ultimate tensile strength. And what that would tell us is, when you welded this thing up, did you change the mechanical properties beyond what's acceptable? Because we'll be able to tell what kind of strength and ductility it has. So this would be another type of destructive test. Um, a nick break is, is another one where you simply you, you take a, a saw and you score the, the specimen all the way around, and then you pull it apart, and you can ex actually examine the weld face to see if there's any trap slag. Those are all soundness tests. And there's one other type of soundness test that you wouldn't think it was a soundness test, uh, 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 just off the top of your head, but it really is, and it's, it's x-ray. Radiography is considered a soundness test because it will show up any discontinuities within the structure of the weldment. So those are, those are all soundness tests, and, and it's got to be qualified. And so they, ASME especially allows qualification of a welder uh, through x-ray. You could actually have a welder go out and make a weld, and this happens a lot. They'll x-ray his first weld, and if it's good, he's, he's great. And if it's not, he's failed, you've got to cut the weld out and start all over again. So uh, most companies like to give them a test first. Let's see. I want you to highlight on page 523 in the second column, the middle of the second paragraph where it reads, perhaps the most important job that the welding inspector can perform during the qualification process is to carefully monitor the actual welding to assure that the procedure is being followed. Uh, I've actually had people take their weld down, set it on the table, and try to weld when I wasn't around. So you've got to watch them. Uh, as I mentioned before, most welders are lazy, but some of them are hungry for a job, and they're desperate to pass a test. And if they can get away with some stuff, uh, some of them will try to. So that might be the most important thing. It says, if problems are encountered during uh, procedure welding, which are the result of inadequacies of the procedure itself, they can possibly be identified and corrected at this stage. Um, then highlight where it talks about mock-ups and put a bullet by it. It says the final method of qualifying a welding procedure is through the use of special test mock-ups. Um, this technique sometimes is used for complex weldment configurations and I gave an example of that. And then down at the bottom, put a bullet by where it says to summarize this discussion of welding procedure qualification, let's look at a general sequence. It starts again on page 528. General sequence of the qualification process. And then they've got a blue box in there that, that, uh, that gives the sequence of, of events that you need to take in qualifying a procedure. Okay, now take a look here. I talked about essential variables before. Essential welding variables. Those are those variables that, if changed beyond certain limits, require a new procedure qualification. And I mentioned that. If, if, if the people that you're, you're supervising uh, run a weld at 175 amps, and yet the limitations on the procedure are 130 amps, they're outside of those uh, uh, parameters, and so you have to have a new procedure. ASME qualification is done to Section 9, and you have to have welding procedure specifications and it's abbreviated WPS, you need to be able to recognize this. And what does a WPS do? It lists the essential welding variables. And to get to the WPS, we have to have the PQR, which is the procedure qualification record. And this notes the actual test conditions. Um, required specimens for, for testing. Prior to qualifying a procedure, you have to determine test specimen requirements for the selected code. And they're listed in there. And you've got several pages in your textbook here that uh, show, show in-shot views. Let me just show you here. It shows you views of where you would remove specimens. Here we have plate specimens. And it's saying, OK, you're going to cut these out, and you're going to do a reduced section tensile pull here. 
or over here on this pipe. It says, okay, you're going to cut this out here and it's going to be 45 to 60 degrees off. And then you're going to do a face bin and a root bin. So the code that you're working to will list all of this. So when the weld is done and, and, and you've accepted it because it's visually okay, then you're going to go to the code and you're going to look up this and it's going to tell you uh, what type of, of test specimens to take out and it's going to tell you how many test specimens to take out. And right over here it says groove weld tension test and transverse bend test. And it will tell you here how many test specimens of each kind has to be taken. So the code doesn't leave anything for chance. It will guide you through there step by step. And uh, we're going to review a lot of that stuff in this particular course. Okay, so we have to take out our specimens. And uh, then you're going to make a test weldment large enough to obtain the proper number of specimens. Uh, consider making it large enough for an extra test specimen or two. And maintain the test weldment and specimen orientation per code. Meaning if, if they want it in the 3G position, you've got to make sure it's in the 3G position. Uh, mock-ups, we talk, talked about mock-ups already. Used for special joint configurations, such as uh, with a restriction ring. And then procedures for qualifying. Now this is what's in your blue box on page 428. The procedures. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to select the welding variables. That would be part of that TIFF that I told you, your test information form. So you're going to make sure that, that you've got all your variables addressed. Uh, then you're going to check the equipment and the material, and you have to record that stuff. Uh, is, is, is the welding equipment that they're using, is it calibrated? Uh, if, it, if, if the welding machine says it's uh, running at 118 amps, is it really running at 118 amps? I, I reviewed some welding procedures for a company a while back, and uh, on their PQR, they said, where it says record the specific amount of amperage read uh, used, well, they gave, me, they gave me one that said amperage used 160 to 230 amps. And what had happened was the guy that qualified that procedure didn't understand what he was doing, and he simply walked out there and looked at the welding machine where the, where the welder had set it. And on these, on these pipeline machines, they have different ranges, like uh, 60 to 100 amps, uh, 160 to 230 amps, 230 to, to 350 amps. And you just go click, 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 and you change it to those ranges. Well, the, as I say, this, this guy that qualified the procedure didn't understand what he was doing. He walked out there and goes, oh, okay, he's, he's on this range. Okay, here's what, what he ran. Well, that's not what he ran. That's the guy did it wrong. You have to record what is actually being used, and you, you use a monitor to record it. Off, typically, I'll put, a, I'll put a set of tongs on the lead, on the welding lead, and then I can read from the, from the tongs exactly what it is. And of course, they have digital readouts now that you can use. So anyway, you want to check the equipment and materials, make sure everything's calibrated properly. Uh, monitor the fit up and, uh, and the welding, and you have to document all of that to make sure that it's all been done correctly. Identify the test specimens, test and evaluate the specimens. Those are all steps you have to do. Then you're going to review the results. Did they meet code requirements? Then you're going to release the approved procedure. Then you're going to qualify your welders to that approved procedure. And then while the work is being done, you're going to monitor the work in progress and make sure everything is doing, being done correctly. Okay, so study that blue book because you're going to have to know some of that stuff there. And then right below that blue box, highlight the paragraph which reads, it must be understood stood that one of the um, most important parts of the procedure qualification process is the use of that procedure during actual production welding. Too often companies perform qualification testing only to satisfy a customer's requirements. When they do that, they say that they're just doing it for audit purposes because they have to have, everything's got to be audited and monitored. And a lot of companies, once they qualify that procedure, okay, they're done. And, and here's a true story. In my, in my working career uh, as a craftsperson, uh, we built some, some compressors and all the certified welders were put on these, pr uh, on these pipes, on these pipes that had to be welded. And they x-rayed a certain percentage. But once those, that certain percentage was x-rayed and there was no customer representative around, anybody that could strike an arc was put on that stuff. So the company that I'd worked for at that time satisfied the requirements of the contract, but they didn't really, they weren't really honest about it. So you have to monitor, you have to watch, because as I said, not only will individuals cheat, but companies will cheat. It says, too often companies perform qualification testing only to satisfy a customer's requirements. Once qualified, they are kept in a neat folder or binder buried on someone's shelf or in a file cabinet. This does not help the welder on the floor who needs to know the information stated in the procedure qualification form. Uh, put a bullet by this, procedures are welding instructions. Therefore, they should be readily available to the welder during production. 
When I'm out on the job, I'll put them in a clear binder and I'll hang them next to where that welder's working. So that if he ever has a question and, and I'm not available, he can go and pull that procedure out and go, oh, here's what, here's what I need right here. So they're instructions to the welder. Okay, so now we've reached the point to where we have qualified our welding procedure. Uh, that is, we, we recorded the essential variables on our PQR. Then we use the PQR to write our welding procedure specification. And now we're going to use the welding procedure specification to qualify our welders. So we're going to give a, each welder that's on the job a test. And what's the purpose of that test? It determines if the individual welders have sufficient skill to produce satisfactory welds using a qualified welding procedure. And I can speak from experience. I've been a certified welding inspector since uh, 1993. And uh, I've tested well over 1,000 welders, probably, close, probably pushing 2,000 at this point in my career. And I can testify to you that my records will show that about one in five uh, is all that can pass a certification test. So I can teach lots of people how to strike an arc and run a welding bead. But in order to meet the requirements of a code, it takes ability, it takes skill, it takes talent, it takes practice. And you've got to do it over and over and over again. Uh, which is why most codes will have, have a person's uh, performance uh, qualification lapse after six months unless they use it. And this is a point that you can put in your back pocket. Most welding certifications are good indefinitely, provided the person uses it at least once within every six months and it is documented that the person did use it in that six month period and that documentation is called a continuity log. Um, one good way to do that is to let's say for example this is a certification paper that you have. Um, it says uh, my name is John Wayne and I'm certified to weld pipe and this is the procedure I use blah 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 and then on the back you can you can simply keep a little calendar and say okay I use this on this date this is what I welded, and it's signed by my foreman over here. Okay, then you go on to the next one, and okay, now I used it again on this date, and this is what I welded, and it's signed by the quality assurance manager. So they're documenting it right on the back of your paperwork, and this then would serve as a continuity log. It proves that you've been using it, and therefore it's good unless you don't use it for six months. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and, and take a look at our next slide. This is uh, drop down to the third paragraph in your text. And it reads, although different in some respects, welder qualification has certain similarities when compared to procedure qualification. Among, among these is the existence of essential variables. In the case of welder qualification, these may include welding position, joint configuration, electrode type and size, the process, base metal type, base metal thickness, and specific welding technique. These features are all concerned with those aspects of the welding operation which are directly affected by the physical abilities of the welder. So, some examples of variables uh, that may affect the welder is the welding position. As I, as I already mentioned, uh, I, I've had people actually take them down and lay them on the tabletop and try to weld them flat because they couldn't weld them out of position. Uh, joint configuration. Some people are, are, are great at welding uh, single V-groove joints, but they're, but they're terrible at welding uh, single bevel joints. What type of electrodes were they used and how big was it? Most people are better at welding with the smaller electrodes like a 332, but you give them a 532 and they don't know what to do. That's too much metal for them. Uh, base metal type and thickness. Some people, of course, can weld carbon steel, but they can't weld stainless steel. And then welding techniques. You have to specify, did they use weaves, weaved technique, or did they use stringer beads, or did they use both? And then did they or did they not have a backing strip on whatever it is that they welded? So all of these are variables that would, uh, would apply to a, a welder's qualification. Um, continuing in, in the next paragraph there, uh, it says codes are generally specific as to the limitations of these variables. And it says figure 5.19 lists position limitations on certain weld types for welder qualification. And that's on your next page. Well, type and position limitations, it depends on the code, uh, what code is being used. And it says, refer to the code for test weldment thickness requirements and limitation on welder qualification. And what happens, uh, what happens is, um, for example, let, let's, let's, take, let's take ASME, for example. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers uh, pipe test, okay? That's a pretty common one. Typical test is six-inch Schedule 80 pipe, which is about 0.432 wall thickness. So it's, 
it's just it's over three eighths of an inch thick. It's less than a half an inch thick. And it used to be that that uh, if you qualified on a test that that had that kind of a wall thickness, you were qualified for twice up to twice that thickness, and down to one eighth. So it gives a range that the welder that took that test is qualified to work in. Um, now ASME has what they call a super coupon test, which is actually double extra heavy wall, and you can do it on a two inch pipe. And this would qualify, it's pretty thick, I don't remember off the top of my head how thick it is, but it's, it's over a half inch thick. And if you qualify on that test, then ASME allows you to be qualified for unlimited thickness. So it doesn't matter how thick it is, you can weld anything. Uh, so they have different ranges that, that you would qualify for, uh, depending on, on the individual code. So you always want to look, because all the codes will specify, okay, if the person takes this test, they're going to be qualified to weld this diameter pipe and this thickness of pipe. Uh, but it's going to change from code to code. And that's what this is all about. You always have to make sure that when you write out the person's certification papers, that you put in the range that those certification papers are good for. Okay. If you look at figure 5.19, it's on the very next page. It has some of those things in there that I was talking about. In fact, I think I have a slide. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Fooled myself. Okay, here we go. This is it. And this one happens to be for, this is the D11 code. And over here we have groove welds and plate welds. And it says qualification test up here in the left-hand corner. 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and then 3G and 4G are put together. So if a person took a, a groove weld plate test under the AWS D1.1 structural welding code, and they tested a, a, did a weld test, test specimen in the 3G and the 4G positions, that would qualify them to weld complete joint penetration welds in all positions. And you would just go on across here and it says all, 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 all. So this is the typical test that's given to, to, to be a plate welder. Down here they have pipe fillets and so forth because D11 doesn't, doesn't still with, uh, deal with pipe. They do deal with uh, uh, K and T groove, different types of pipe config, uh, tubular configurations, but they don't really deal with pressure piping. So that's D11. Uh, ASME is different, and I don't know if you have that in your test in, in here or not. Uh, no, they don't give the ranges in here. Uh, flip the page. I want to draw your attention to page 531. If you're not certain of, when, when I'm saying 1G, 2G, those are the positions, and the G stands for groove. And I mentioned this before. If it's 1F, 2F, the F stands for fillet, for fillet weld. And if it's 1G, 2G, then it's a, G, then it's a groove weld. And here's a test position 1G, so it's a flat. Here's a 2G, horizontal. Here's a 3G, vertical. And if you're welding in the vertical, you have to specify, did they weld from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom? So that's your progression. And you have to specify that. It was vertical up or it was vertical down. And then we have overhead. So these are all plate positions. Down here, we have plate positions on fillet welds. And we have the flat position, 1F. Horizontal position, 2F. That's as if you were to take it and just set it straight on the tabletop. Then we have the 3F, or vertical position. And then the 4F, the overhead position. Flip the page. And then we have some, some for pipe welds. Now, pipe welds are just a little bit different. You have the uh, 1G rotated, where you might put it in a pinwheel, and it's slowly rotating. And you're actually just welding on the top. So it's flat. So that's, that would be the 1G. Um, the 2G is where it's in, in the vertical fixed. It means it's, it's, it's stuck in position, running straight up and down, but you're going to weld it horizontally. So that would be the 2G position. Uh, and it says so right here, test position 2G. Here we have the 5G position, where it is the horizontal fixed. We had vertical fixed, now we have horizontal fixed. The pipe can't move, but you're welding from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom. So this is your 5G test position. And then here we have the 6G position, which is the, it's, it's referred to as the Arkansas bell, bell hole. That's kind of a slang term. And it, it, it got that name because, the, because of the Ozarks in, in the state of Arkansas. They're so hilly that you can't run a straight pipeline. It's, it's always at an angle. So they, they kind of got that nickname as an Arkansas bell hole. Uh, but it's the 6G position. And this is the position that you would test most welders in. And then over here, we have one with a restricting ring. So this would be called the 6GR or restricted. The R is for restricted. 6GR position. So study those because you're going to have some questions about those 
uh, in your test. Okay, now let's go back to our board. And we're on page 530 now. And I want you to highlight in the first column, beginning with the second sentence where it reads, however, if the welder qualifies on pipe, he or she is automatically qualified on plate. Important aspect there. Uh, it can be further noted that plate groove qualifications in the 3G and 4G positions will qualify that welder for all positions of plate. Also, qualification in either 6G or 2G and 5G positions will qualify the welder for all positions of pipe except those in the T, K, and Y connections. Uh, the 6GR test position, however, will provide full coverage for all pipe positions and configurations. Now, what a bullet by this next paragraph. These num uh, numeric designations for these test positions are simply abbreviations and should be remembered by the welding inspector. Figures 5.20 through 5.23 are illustra illustrations of the various test positions for plate grooves, plate fillets, pipe grooves, and pipe fillets, respectively. So position designations, they're different for plate and pipe. Uh, they're different for grooves and fillets. And you must know the positions and their designations. And you will be tested on those, not only in the module test, but also on your final test. And if you ever go to take your CWI exam, uh, you won't be able to pass that test if you don't understand these designations. Um, Thickness to range qualified. Uh, read the next paragraph. It says another important essential variable which determines what coverage is obtained from the completion of a specification test is the thickness and test plate or pipe. So thickness range is qualified depends on the code and it depends on the test, thickman, uh, test specimen thickness. And I already talked about that a little bit. Uh, some of them will qualify you for twice the thickness that was welded. Some of them have specific uh, minimums and specific maximums. Uh, on the thickness ranges. Drop down to the next paragraph where it reads, another essential variable is the joint configuration itself. To determine this effect, standard test plates and pipes are used to approximate the necessary configurations. Uh, one of the more important aspects of the joint configuration is the presence or absence of weld backing. In DE 1.1, there are specific references to the direction of rolling of the plate materials when using backing. Uh, the t ductility of the metal will vary depending on its rolling direction. Um, I don't remember if I've covered this yet. If I haven't, we will cover it. I believe it's actually in module, either, I think it's module six where we talk, talk about plate and the rolling direction. Uh, real briefly, we'll get into this more as we, in, in the next module. But if you've got a piece of plate and, and, and when it comes out of the mill, it, it, it goes through some rollers. And that's why they call it its, its uh, its rolling direction and, and they're going to pull that through those rollers and it's, it's a lot thicker and bulkier and back here and then it's kind of squeezed down and what that does is it compresses the metal and it elongates the grains and so the, the metal properties are different in the uh, X, Y and Z pardon me that's terrible Z, Z direction this is your Z direction this is your X direction and this is your Y direction um, your strength and ductility will be about 30% greater if you've, you've cut it off like this and, you're, and, you're, and you've gone, you're, you're making your specimens in the X uh, direction. If you cut it like this and then you try to make a bend uh, in the Y direction, you're going to have much less uh, ductility and much less strength. So that, when they're talking about rolling direction, this is what they're talking about. How was it, how was it rolled? And how did, how did you cut it to put it into service? And that's a mistake that a lot of engineers make. They don't, or the fabricators make. You know, the engineer may, may take that into consideration when he's doing the design, but he doesn't pass that information on to the fabricator, the people that are putting it together. And I've, I, I've actually uh, seen some weld tests fail because they cut, they cut the specimens in the wrong direction, and we had to do all the testing over again. So that's another thing that you want to, uh, want to be aware of. And it says, the ductility of the metal will vary depending on its rolling direction. If bend tests are performed on test specimens in which the plate rolling direction was in the transverse direction, uh, the base metal may fail. It is therefore important to assure that the plates are properly oriented prior to the qualification testing. And that's exactly what happened. They, I felt a bunch of welders for that, and then I said, wait a second, let's check this out, and got with their shop foreman and found out that he'd prepped the material all wrong. Okay, so here, I've got this slide here. This is backed and non-backed. And so here's an open root with a one eighth inch root open, and here's one with a, with a backing strip. Uh, this, is, this is a fillet weld specimen. 
Um, here, we, we, we administer this test a ton, ton of times. These are eight inches long, and they're going to do a fillet weld test with a start and stop in the center there. When they're all done, we'll inspect it for visual to see if it's good. Then we'll cut an inch off of each end, and uh, we'll do what's called a macro etch examination on those, where we, we, we will sand it down to a spiffy, clean, smooth surface, and we'll pour some acid on it. And then that tells us how far into the parent metal they, they fused. And then we'll take this remaining six inches, and we'll do what's called a fillet weld break. And we'll break that off, and then we'll examine the root to make sure that they, they had good print penetration on the root. So read about that. That's in the next column, uh, the second paragraph. Then here we have the 6GR. That's in the third paragraph where it, see, where it reads, the final test joint configuration used in AWS is referred to as the 6GR. Um, and you can see, now here, here there's only a one half inch offset. That, that restrictor ring is only set a half inch away. And this happens to be a single bevel configuration where one end is straight and the other side is beveled. So that's what a 6GR would look, look like. Um, then we get to electrode groups. Drop down to the last two paragraphs, highlight everything there, and read about the different electrode groups. So I'm going to read a little bit. It says the electrodes in group 4F are considered to be the more difficult types to use. And similarly, the F1 group includes those types which are considered to, to require the least manual ability. Normally, qualification of an electrode of a higher um, number group will automatically qualify that welder for welding with any electrode of a group bearing a lower number. Therefore, qualification tests performed with E7018 electrode, which is in the group F4, will provide the welder with qualification coverage for all of the carbon steel, shield, and metal arc welding electrodes. So that's a bullet on that, on that paragraph. Put a bullet on the next one, which reads, the specific welding technique used is also considered to be an essential variable for welder qualification. Changes in such details as the direction of welding for the vertical position will require additional qualification testing or other typical technique related essential variables may include changes in the processes, positions, type of metal, and so, so, so forth and so on. So read about that. And then here, this slide says qualify versus certify, okay? And, and that's a distinction that you need, you need to be aware of. What do they mean? To qualify, it means that the welder has the ski, skill to weld. To certify means that he has documents to support the fact that he has the skills to weld, he or she. Go to page 535 and highlight the uh, first paragraph, second part of the first paragraph where it reads, the welding inspector may be asked to witness the actual welding to verify procedure compliance as well as to note the ability of the welder. Careful attention to the techniques and abilities of the welder could reveal habits which might produce unsatisfactory welds. Uh, this is a little bit of stuff that we've already covered. But on that page, also highlight it in the first column, the last paragraph. Um, on the next paragraph, next column, highlight the very top where it says, virtually all welder qualification test specimens are generally characterized as soundness tests, including bend test, nick, break test, and fillet tests. Remember, I talked about those before. Uh, also, keep in mind that radiography is considered a soundness test. Drop down to the last paragraph in that column and highlight it and put a bullet by it. It says, at this point, it is appropriate to differentiate between the terms qualify and certify as applied to these welder tests. If we say that a welder is qualified, we mean that he or she has demonstrated sufficient skill to perform a certain weld. Certification, however, applies to the documents which support this qualification. A welder who successfully passes a qualification test would then be rightfully referred to as a qualified welder. Okay. That's it. Um, I've got a couple of more slides, but they're not really that going to be important. I'm running out of time on this tape. And what I want to tell you now is in your student packet, you'll find some material. Uh, you'll, find, you'll find copies of PQRs, WPSs, and WPQRs, and, and some directions. I want you to follow the directions, and you're going to take the PQR form, and you're going to enter the information on those directions into the PQR form. Then I want you to take the, the information off the PQR form 
and write a WPS, a welding procedure specification. And then finally, I want you to take the information off the, off the WPS and fill out some WPQR forms um, so that you'll have experience filling out all three types of forms. And then finally, there is a uh, Module 5, Part 2 Take Home Practice Quiz, which covers PQRs, WPSs, and WPQRs. And uh, I believe there's 17 questions there, and I would ask you to answer those questions. Again, that's just a practice quiz, but it will be typical of the type of questions that we're going to be asking on the uh, module exam. Uh, email me if you have any questions, and thank you very much for your time.